very good at using search engines and are starting um, to use them in much more sophisticated ways. So, you know, this is a really great example of a user experience journey. This is done by a company out of uh, the UK called Spotless. I can take no credit for it. Uh, but I think it's really interesting. So like at the bottom there, you have your typical you know, marketing consideration process, inquire, compare, purchase, collect, travel, et cetera, et cetera. And above that, you have the kind of windy customer journey. So in this particular case, this is Sarah Rhodes, who has decided to go visit her friend and ultimately decides to take a uh, train to do so. So that kind of windy journey is her saying, well, you know, I talked to my friend, I want to go, I'm going to pull up my favorite website, oh no, I forgot what my password is, so now I've got to reset my password, all the way to actually making the purchase and deciding to take it over to go there. And then above that, you have the emotional journey, right? The fears, the desires, the want, the delight of actually being there. So what search engines are trying to do is adapt to our ability um, to search in more sophisticated ways and make more complex decisions. And again, you can see that they're adapting and changing along the way. So Google has come out and said that 15% of all search queries they see every day, they've never seen before. So as humans, we are wildly inventive in coming up with new language to ask questions or communicate our needs. Nearly 60% of all search traffic now originates from mobile devices. You know, for many people, this is their primary computer. And by 2020, more than 50% of all searches are going to be voice-based. They're not going to be computer-based at all, so that really changes the user experience. So, you know, if you think about search engines broadly, what they really exist to do is help people uh, connect with relevant information and to take action once they do. Does anybody here have background in user experience design? Okay, that's user experience, right? So fundamentally, if search engines are about delivering a optimal user experience, then in order to win at SEO, you have to remember that audience is more important than algorithm. Because the algorithm is the mathematical expression of how search engines understand positive user experience. And what they're really trying to do is make you as a marketer, as an SEO, optimize your website to deliver the best possible user experience in a way that the search engine can understand, and then you will win. Everybody with me so far? Does it make sense? Anybody think of full of shit more than usual? <laughs> no? Okay. So again, to win, you have to really deliver an exceptional human-centered experience. So let's talk a little bit about, well, actually, let's take a step back and start by just understanding some of the fundamentals of SEO. Has anybody ever seen the periodic table of SEO success factors? Okay, I love this. I think it is the simplest explanation that I've seen of uh, what drives SEO success. And you know, it's a little oversimplified, but for the beginners in the room, I think it does a pretty good job of uh, summing up the, the big idea. So the way that this is broken out is there's really two buckets of factors, on the page and off the page. So on the page factors start with content. Do you have content that is actually valuable to your intended audience? Shocking, right? It's like marketing 101. But do you have content that is deep, rich, relevant, and actually fulfills a need? Then, also on the page, you have technical elements. So you have items like architecture and HTML, which are really about, are you making it easy for uh, the uh, search engine crawlers and bots? You know, they send all these little software programs that read a web page. Are you making it easy for them to understand the quality of the content that you have on the page, or are you making it hard? Then you have off-the-page factors, which are really all about trust and authority. And this was really Google's big innovation in the late 90s. What they discovered is, is that there tends to be a relationship between good content and the people that are linking back to it. So uh, in other words, you know, like a link from the Washington Post is better than from my mother's blog, right? So, uh, that has really expanded over time. So search engines uh, not only look at the quality of what are called backlinks now, so who's linking back to you, but also a whole host of different citations and authority signals. So things like your online reputation. So you know you have a lot of you know one star reviews or people complaining about you. So like sentiment, social media sharing, and velocity of sharing. There's a number of different factors there. But really, the easy way to think about it is: are people sharing and liking your content and generally saying good things about you. If they are, then you're probably gonna be okay in terms of the off-the-page factors. 
Okay, so as we're talking about the rest, just kind of remember on the page, off the page. Um, another thing that I want to go over quickly is just to talk about kind of the trend from the user experience side is some changes and algorithm updates that Google's been making. And again, because Google's the 800 pound gorilla, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about Google today. Um, although the fact of the matter is, is that other search engines are quite good. They're just a little bit behind Google, usually by a couple of years. So if you're well optimized for Google, you're generally well optimized for the other search engines too. Um, but if you're really interested in understanding all the nitty gritty of the Google's algorithm updates, you can go to that link at the bottom. Search Engine Land is a great resource. Um, and Google makes about 500 or so updates to their algorithm every year. Most are pretty small. Some are really big, and I want to talk about a couple of the bigger ones over the last couple of years because I think they're instructive in terms of how uh, Google in particular thinks about uh, positive uh, user experience and its impact on SEO. So the first one I want to talk about is RankBrain. Is anybody not familiar with RankBrain? Okay. So um, RankBrain launched in late 2015, and it was really a rebuilding of the, of the engine, so to speak. And uh, what they did is they deployed a machine learning algorithm that was designed to better understand conversational queries. So what I mean by that is, you know, if you go back to you know, the late you know, 90s, kind of early mid-2000s, a lot of people talked to search engines like a computer. You know, they would say, you know, red shoes Durham. And what's happened over time is we've gotten a lot more comfortable with, you know, searching. So now we talk to it like people. We say, where can I go buy red Nike shoes in downtown Durham? Right? It's a much more conversational query. The problem is, is that it adds more variety in terms of the language that's being used and what is actually relevant in terms of results. So RankBrain was initially designed to help better understand those conversational queries, deliver content that better aligns to the intent, and get rid of spam. Right? So um, there's a couple of interesting things that come out of this. One is that Google really doesn't understand how Google's search engine works anymore because the machine's learning all the time, right? Second is you end up with some really interesting variations um, in terms of content. So um, I actually don't have it in this deck. I forgot that I'd taken it out. But um, you can end up with some slight variations. So things like um, how to make a pizza, how to bake a pizza, and pizza recipe all like, sound like they're the same query, but you actually get slightly different results because they have slightly different intent. Um, the next uh, one you have is Fred. And Fred is the kind of jokingly named, this is what happens when you let SEOs name algorithm updates. Uh, uh, with the exception of Ryan Brain and a couple others, Google usually doesn't come out and, and name them, so this is what happens. Uh, but anyhow, rolled out in uh, early 2017, and it was really designed to impact sites that had a poor user experience and were overemphasizing ads. So things like this. Like if you went to the site, does it feel trustworthy to you? No, not really. You know, you're dealing with things like you know, ads, kind of block text, doesn't feel really rich or relevant, it's pretty shallow in terms of how it's, it's structured. Google doesn't like that kind of stuff. Uh, next, you have the rollout of what's called the Mobile First in Index in uh, early 2018, which is actually a little bit of, mis of a misnomer because there was never really a desktop index and a mobile index. Um, but without getting into a long technical conversation, um, what happened here is as the amount of mobile search accelerated, again, it's over 50% you know, um, at this point, Google is encouraging uh, webmasters to have one version of a website with multiple experiences. And it's really kind of an omni-channel experience. So what they're trying to do is get a user to be able to go to a site on desktop, continue on a mobile device, then go back you know, to it later on a tablet, and all consume the same information. So what you're really seeing is they're rewarding sites that have responsibly designed um, pages instead of like a mobile version of the site and a desktop version of the site. Last but certainly not least, uh, late last year, you had uh, a core algorithm update rolled out that's you know, kind of been nicknamed the Medic update uh, because it had, or researchers think that it's had a large impact on medical and health uh, websites, although not exclusively so. And um, what it looks like is that Google is rewarding sites that adhere to the expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness, or EAT guidelines. Is anybody familiar with those? Okay, so one of the interesting things is 
you know, Google uses machine learning algorithms to kind of rate sites, but they actually also employ human reviewers. And they actually publish the uh, guides that they train their human reviewers with. So if you go to that bit.ly link that's down there, um, you can read this guide. It's about a hundred and some odd pages. It's great reading to put yourself to sleep to. It reads like stereo instructions. But it's actually really insightful, right? Because they explicitly tell you this is what we think high quality content is and this is what we think a well-designed page is. So you can just read that and do it and you will be rewarded. Again, you're not gonna rocket to number one that way, but what Google wants is best practices, best practices, best practices. Okay? So, uh, if you can't tell by now, I'm a big believer that in order to win in SEO, you have to be uh, user-centered, and to be user-centered, you really have to think about user experience. And it is a very broad topic in the design world. Um, I won't spend much time going into huge detail because it is so, so deep, but I do want to talk about uh, a couple of principles, five principles, of what it means to be human-centered as it relates to design and how that carries forward in search engine optimization. So first, you have to make sure that you have human centricity to everything that you do. So what I mean by that is that in order to create effective solutions that really uh, meet the needs of the user, you have to think through the challenges and opportunities that the real people who are using your website consider. Second is that you have to have emotional empathy. So in order to create solutions that actually address people's needs, you have to understand how they think, how they feel, what their perceptions are of their experience. You then have to be able to create as many possibilities as possible. Why? Because you need to test, right? So you want to understand a large pool of potential solutions that you can apply to your website and test against them. You want to be able to be outcome driven, and I'll explain kind of why in a second here. But the uh, essential idea is, is that users are always trying to achieve something, <laughs> so you need to make sure that you can help them achieve that. And last but certainly not least, you'll have to have a mentality of consistent improvement and continuous improvement because that experience never, uh, optimizing that experience never ends because as humans, as users, we're always evolving. Now, the simplest way to think about user experience as it relates to SEO is this. Every click or interaction should take the user closer to their goal while eliminating as much of the non-destination, also what is referred to as distraction, as possible. So there's really only two reasons why somebody is, trying, is going to visit your website. They're trying to learn something or they're trying to do something. The more you can make that easy and then help them advance to the next step, the better you're going to do from an SEO perspective, and the happier your customer or your user is going to be. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, so I want to <clears throat> dig in a little bit more into how to actually do all of these things. So, um, first and foremost, uh, you got to understand your user enough, and a great way to understand your user is to build personas. Does anybody here have user personas or audience personas? Those of you that have them, does anybody use them for SEO purposes? Okay. So uh, the easiest way to think about uh, user personas is, is that they're semi-fictional representations of real people, so real groups of folks. Um, and they're designed to document behaviors, demographics, attitudes, and desires. And they come in lots of different formats. So you have the Teach Me Tina version, you have the, what is that? coffee shop, uh, Sarah student version, uh, you have the wedding, uh, William the wedding photographer version, or at least the casual version, it doesn't really matter how you document them, as long as they all kind of contain the same information. And this is kind of what you want to look at. So first, you want to gather what data. So what I mean by what data is how are people behaving? This is typically quantitative data. So what are, what's the kind of content that people are consuming? How long are they on your site? What are they clicking on? Uh, if you have experiences uh, that you're touching the customer outside of the web, you know, things like, you know, they're walking into your retail store, what are they buying, what are they browsing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all really great data sources to pull from. 
Um, however, that doesn't tell you why they're doing any of those things. So in order to understand why, you have to gather different kinds of data, things like demographics, psychographics, survey data. This is typically what's referred to as qualitative information. And the qualitative inf information will help you kind of peek behind the curtain to understand the uh, drivers behind that behavior. Then what you do is you start to break out audiences into cohorts. So these are similar um, groupings of folks based on common traits or behaviors. So you can understand kind of what the consistencies are. And then you can start to build your audience story. So for each of those cohorts, who are they and why are they behaving that way? So when you're dealing with what data, we're all drowning in it, right? So as, as marketers, as SEOs, uh, we have no lack of data points that we can look at. Uh, this is the MarTech 5000, which is actually now about 7,000, 7,200 um, different platforms. Uh, but this is an infographic that just shows the current landscape for all of the marketing and sales data that folks like us have access to. It doesn't really matter what platforms you're using. You're trying to understand how people are behaving and how they're interacting with your website and your company. Um, I would also encourage you from a qualitative perspective, go talk to your customer. It's one of the best things you can do. Um, I'm a big believer in customer development. Is anybody familiar with Steve Blank, by any chance? Okay, so a little bit of background. So um, for those of you that don't, uh, Steve Blank is a uh, professor, um, super smart guy, serial uh, CEO and entrepreneur. And at one point he got interested in uh, better understanding why some companies and some products succeed or fail. And he went out and did a whole bunch of surveying and kind of analysis, and what he figured out is somewhat you know, unsurprisingly, the companies that succeed do two things differently. One is, is that they talk to their customers a whole lot and ask them what they want and what they don't want, and then they build what they want and don't build what they think they might want, right? They actually ask the question. So the best way to understand what your customers are trying to do and why they're behaving the way they are, is just go talk to them. Ask those questions. Um, when you gather all that information, you can then build out this audience story. And this is just kind of a, a simple example of it, which I'll read quickly, uh, which is Toby has a day job at a record store. On the, uh, and, but on the side, she also does all kinds of production work for up and coming artists. She never hesitates to learn something new, and she often acts as tech support for her friends and clients. She's usually working on a dozen prospects at a time and is trying to establish herself in the industry so she hates data crashes or anything that makes her look bad. Because she works alone and in her home, collaboration is everything. Right? Starts to give you a real sense of who this kind of person is and what they may be trying to achieve or to avoid in interacting with your website. Right? Make sense so far? Now, Again, these come in lots of different formats. Um, there are a couple of interesting tools that you can use if you really want to expand out your audience personas. Um, one is extensio.com, uh, maybe use a persona tool, um, and another is uxpressa. Uh, but again, you don't have to use those tools. Um, you can, actually I think it was on here, if you go to that link down at the bottom, there's a format that you, uh, like a template that you can download and just fill out that'll actually look some, somewhat similar. This. The idea, though, is that with personas, is, is if you do the research and document it, it gives you a lens through which you can make better decisions about what your audience actually wants, so you can then orient your site to give it to them. Now, once you understand your audience a little bit more, you have to think about how they're actually using search engines, and the way that's done is through keyword research. Now, keyword research, as I'm sure most of us have a, at least a little bit of familiarity with this, is really just what is the kind of language that people are, are using while they search? Like, what, what are the queries? And there's a, kind of this idea here of head versus tail. And the very short version is, is that the shorter the query, you know, one, two words, the higher the volume, but the less specific it is in terms of, like, transaction or, like, ultimate action that they want to take. And as you go down the tail, the search volume gets lower, but it gets much more specific. And the more aligned your content is to the specific tail keyword, the more likely it is that somebody's going to take an action. So there's kind of that, that relationship. Um, but so again, you understand your personas at this point and kind of the different audiences you want to talk to. 
Um, you start doing keyword research, and we'll talk a little bit in a minute about some tools you can use to use that. Um, but I want to talk a little bit first about the difference between company language and customer language, because I see organizations run into this problem all the time. Um, so uh, by way of an example, uh, a couple of years ago we were working with a software and uh, data management uh, company. Um, I won't name them because they're multinational and they probably sue me if I did. But anyhow, it's a great start. So they had a product that was all about email verification. And what that is, for those of you that may not be aware, is um, they worked with uh, marketers or they sold to marketers that had large email or direct mail lists and uh, would cleanse them. So it was all about uh, uh, data management and kind of data quality. So in, you know, if somebody like fat fingers an email address, so it's you know, the hidden Jake at G A I N L, it's a you know, Jake at Gmail, they would clean that up, right? They would also um, you know, make sure that it was not a total like, gibberish email address. Um, they had a new sales leader come in who wanted to move up market and focus on what they were calling email hygiene. Well, email hygiene is a little bit different in their industry. What email hygiene is, is it takes not only kind of the fat finger stuff, but looks at things like what are spam traps, so fake email addresses that ISPs will set up to see if you're a bad user uh, or a bad email marketer, and you're just like sending to anybody. Things like role email addresses, so you know, jobs at methodsavvy.com would clean kind of all that, that up. Um, and so we were doing um, SEO and paid search work for them, and they had decided that you know, they wanted to stop focusing on email verification and start focusing on email IG because they were convinced that's who they needed to sell to. So we said, okay, well, let's go take a look at this. Um, and the screenshot you're seeing is from a uh, tool called Ahrefs, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but uh, we went and we said, we looked, we said, okay, well, does not have a ton of volume on a monthly basis, you know, and kind of globally, you're looking at 100 or so searches. Uh, but very low competition, so you know, there's not a lot of uh, folks, especially of their size, uh, that are going to invest there. Um, however, email verification has a lot of competition, but also has a lot of search volume, and by the way, they already owned this space. Like, they were fairly consistently, you know, page one SERP, you know, three, you know, two, one position. So the challenge there is, is that if you, if they only looked at what they wanted to go after, they would have destroyed their uh, organic performance because they weren't really focusing on what the customer was looking for. They were ahead of where the customer was looking for. So really, again, putting yourself in your audience's shoes and your customer's shoes to understand how they think rather than how you want them to think is going to allow you to do much, much better keyword research. So once you uh, have the opportunity to kind of build your personas, think through um, the language that they're using, then you can really dive into the tools. And there's lots of good keyword research tools that you can use. Um, the first here is uh, SpyFu, so it's spyfu.com. Uh, you can actually play around with it a little bit if you're online. There's a free trial that you can use. It has a reasonably good data set. Um, the second is SEMrush, which uh, actually does have a seven day trial. Um, so after that, I think it's like $80 a month. Uh, there's Ahrefs, which is one of my favorites, um, not only because they have good keyword data, but they also have great uh, backlink uh, data. Uh, and then uh, there's also other tools like um, LSI, oh, I'm sorry, this is uh, Ubersuggest or lsigraph.com. So to talk about what, what they do a little bit. So Ubersuggest not only looks at um, data like these other um, keyword research tools, but if you ever go to Google and you start to type something in, you get the auto-suggest results. Well, they scrape that, and then they'll put this into this tool. So it's a way of expanding the uh, reach and kind of breadth of your keyword research to getting into different kind of phraseologies. Same thing with LSI graph. So LSI stands for Latent Semantic Indexing. Um, it's a statistical model that allows search engines to look at um, Kind of the easiest way to explain it is look at the natural variation in language that somebody's using. So when you're looking at like on-page copy, uh, search engines really don't want you to have like a robotic copy that's like really tuned for the algorithm. They want it to be natural. They want it to be audience-focused. LSI is kind of a way for them to to 
evaluate that. LSI graph is a tool that looks at variation of language based on how people are actually searching, including um, the um, uh, auto suggest, so you can get more variation of language. So the approach to keyword research has to be understand your audience, understand what they're trying to achieve, and then what you can start to use is use these tools to build out kind of a almost like a mind map kind of pocket of different keywords. So, um, you know, if this is kind of an example of what you could do. So if you're thinking about, you know, a keyword being Google search engine, you can get kind of pockets of related keyword themes and build out long lists of keywords. Um, I'm a big believer that from a keyword research side, what you really want to do is focus on a topic level and natural um, variation of language rather than like, I'm going to tune this page to a very specific keyword. I think that's the old way of doing SEO. Uh, um, a lot of it has to do with rank brain, but I'll talk about that in a little bit in a couple minutes as we talk a little bit more about content. But again, those are all really great tools you can use to start to kind of get a long list of keywords, start breaking them down into related topics, and then look at natural language variation, and then ladder that all back up to your understanding of your, your user and your customer. Okay. So at this point, you understand your audience, you understand the language that they're using, so let's talk about content and what it means to create remarkable content. <clears throat> so there's good news and bad news on this. Um, the bad news is, is that search engines don't want just any kind of content. They want really, really great content. Content that is 10x, 12x better than anything else that's out there. The good news is, is that most people are really bad at making content. So depending on your vertical, there's ample opportunity to create really good content. Um, you know, if you're in certain verticals, you're going to have a little bit of a harder time. But uh, what does it really mean to have remarkable content? Well, first, it has to be high quality. So as I talked about earlier, it has to be deep, rich, relevant, unique, and for better or for worse, really should be long. So uh, this data comes from a company called Backlinko. They did an audit of a million SERPs or so, um, and we're looking at the average length of copy on the page and it's just under 1,900 words. Which I always found really interesting because when you have over half of all search volume that's mobile, would you read something that long on a mobile device? Probably not. But what they're trying to do is they make it easily skimmable, so it's all about design, and again, what search engines really want is something that has some meat on it that's not, not thin. Um, so, remarkable content has to be high quality, it has to be trustworthy, and what trustworthy means in uh, the SEO world is really two things. One is when you land on the page, it has to be designed in such a way that it doesn't look like you're trying to scam them. Right? It has to look professional. Um, and you also need to have a reasonable backlink portfolio. So this data also comes from backlink, again, with this um, audit. Uh, they found that a average page one SERP uh, result had anywhere from about 50 to 300 unique trusted domains that were linking back to them. So these aren't individual links, this is different .coms, .edus, .govs, that are linking back to them. Um, it has to be aligned to intent, so it actually has to be useful. And an interesting way to think about this is really around uh, topic relevancy. Um, and again, a lot of this has to do with uh, rank brain, some optimizations to rank brain over time. So um, the simplest way to think about this is kind of old way versus topic clusters. Um, and uh, HubSpot has a really great article about this. Again, the link's at the bottom there if you're interested. Uh, but the old way of doing it would be to pick a keyword that you really want to rank for, build out a piece of content for it, and then optimize that page for that keyword with that content and just have it like sitting somewhere on your site. Right? Now, um, what really good SEOs and really good content marketers do is they build out these topic clusters. So you end up with these related pages with varying kinds of information that have an internal linking structure that helps both the user and the search engine understand that these are related topics. So I'll use uh, SEO as an example. You know, you can say, what is search engine optimization? How to do keyword research? How to build audience personas? How to optimize a page? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you have a core topic and then you have subtopics. Rank uh, Brain loves that because what Rank Brain is looking for is content comprehensiveness and content depth. So it's no longer enough just to build out one really great page. 
you have to think about it in kind of a holistic system. Uh, so the content has to be differentiated from the competition, right? It's not nearly enough to just be as good as everybody else. It has to be entertaining. Um, and I would argue, most importantly, it needs to be emotionally memorable. So uh, is anybody familiar with Robert Pluchak's Wheel of Emotions? Okay. I find this really interesting. So Robert Pluchak uh, was a social scientist born in the 20s, died in the 90s, if I remember correctly. I was a professor emeritus at Albert Einstein College and I think Stanford. Um, anyhow, really smart dude. And um, he got interested in how humans feel and are the emotional states that we have. And he went out and worked with his associates to map out all human emotions. And he found out that we have about 30,000 of them. Okay? And then what he did is he built this kind of color wheel system around it that um, categorizes these emotions. And um, they found that you know, humans at their core really have eight like, core emotions and then variations of them. So they are ecstasy, admiration, terror, amazement, grief, loathing, rage, and vigilance. Now why is this important? Well, <coughs> we're human animals, right? So you know, we all have this uh, limbic system, and then we have this thing called the hippocampus that's in our brain that controls two very important things, emotion and long-term memory, right? So the easiest way to think about it is people will always, almost always forget what you would tell them, but they will never forget how you make them feel. So why is that important for SEO? Um, well, again, it goes back to Frank Brain and some of the recent um, algorithm updates. So, yes? So the search engine, can, can they discern the emotional impact of a site? Kind of. So the, the way that they do it is there's two signals that Rank Brain will look at to help understand relevancy and will reward or punish based on it. One is click-through rate. So if you're on a SERP and if you know, they look at the average click-through rate for when somebody's searching, what they hit on your result, and for every 3% above the expected click-through rate it is, you'll move up one position. For every 3% lower, you'll move down one position. The second thing is they look at how long the click lasts, so what's called short click versus long click. So if a uh, user clicks through and then 10 seconds later comes back and continues their search, Google's gonna go, oh, they must not have found what they're looking for. Right? The site's not sticky enough, it's not compelling enough, it's not emotionally compelling enough. However, if they click through and they go away, you know, they don't come back and continue <coughs> search, or they come back and search for something different, Google will go, oh, they must have found what they're looking for, it must have been compelling enough. Also, there's some really good kind of um, user psychology that shows like, like, this is what brand's all about, ultimately, and if you have a, um, brand that elicits the right kind of emotional response, it becomes more trusted, and it makes it much easier for somebody to uh, want to share your content or advocate for you online. So that's the saturation of the emotional impact, but is there a sentiment analysis where you can tell, I really dislike what I've just seen, or, or that, that is, that's not there in any of So that's not what, what search engines will look at. They will look at that from a user experience standpoint. So like the um, picture I showed earlier, like is there a overly advertising laden structure to the page? Does it not content rich? And they're really looking at like, is this something that so if I a mean, normal user would go to it? Saturation, yeah. how, how much of an impact? Yeah. Okay, so what is good content look like? Well, there's a couple of examples here. And again, there's links at the bottom of the deck um, if you desire to check it out. So the first one here on the left side is Trusted Pros. Um, I think this one's really interesting because what they're doing is they're looking at what the licensing requirement are for contractors in Canada. So this is really valuable because if you're a contractor in Canada and you want to know what licenses you need, well, you can go look at this. And if you're a customer and you need a contractor, you know what licenses that you should ask if they have or not. This is a nice long page that kind of describes all the licenses um, that they need. Um, the middle one is from a company called Outbrain about native advertising. Um, for those of you that don't know, native advertising is a form of advertising that's really kind of content focused. 
Um, but what's interesting about this one is it's a nice long format page. This is actually kind of the whole page, just you know, side by side there. But it starts with general information, saying like, what is it? And then as you move down the page, it'll frame an issue and then link to a subpage that's equally as long that goes into more depth. So they've done the topic clustering very well there in a way that's also just visually designed well. Um, and then the one on the right is an algebra calculator. What I like about this one is there's not much content on the page, but I don't know about you, I can't remember algebra, and it's really helpful with my kids. So it's just useful. It uses it, we'll go back to it all the time, really great stuff. So it doesn't have, you don't have to worry about the same format of content to make it really great. It just has to be aligned to the user, actually have meaning and value, um, and it has to be easy enough to use. Make sense? Okay. So I know I was downplaying technical a little bit earlier, but you do kind of have to worry about some technical elements. Um, what I will say is, is that in working with lots of brands over the years, um, ignore technical at your own peril. If they're gonna fuck up something, it's usually this. So I'll give you an example. I was um, actually just meeting with this client earlier this week, but this actually happened last summer. Um, they're a large multinational brand that uh, is busy season is during the summer and they're a consumer products brand and they sell through, through retailers. For some reason, they decided to relaunch their website right at the beginning of their busy season. Great idea, right? It was like the spring. They're like, oh, it'd be great, everybody would use it. However, we were not, at the time at least, engaged with them on uh, organic search. And they relaunched the website, it looked a whole lot better. Um, but does anybody know what noindex is in robots.txt? Yeah, so it's an instruction to search engines that says don't index the site. The developers they used had that on the dev site, which you should do, but when they ported it live, they forgot to remove it. So they de-indexed themselves for three months before they started going, hey, our sales are going down, what's happening? Because nobody looked at it. It's because they didn't pay enough attention to the technical. So um, I won't spend a ton of time here. Uh, yes? I want to throw out that this is one example that you're mentioning, but this happens all, all the time. time. <laughs> all the time. It is, it is amazing how, and I've never really understood this, how website development companies don't know shit about SEO. I don't understand how you can do that. You would figure that would be like the first thing they would teach you, but no, they do it all the time. And they come up with really inventive ways to screw it up too. Uh, but anyhow, so I won't get too much into the um, technical side here, but I do want to kind of point out some tools uh, that you can use and some things you can look at. Yes, sir? So the, um, we were talking about Ask that question again. Are you, are you, are you, I want to make sure I'm understanding it. Are you talking about it from the perspective of the search engines? Well, uh, to start with, uh, you know, there are sites that review your links to make yes. sure that they're not broken. Yes. And they're also performant that you get loaded as fast as possible. Yep. Do they, are there sites that cover SEO at the same time? So there are tools that you can use that will do varying levels of technical audits on, on the site, some of which I'm gonna talk about. Um, the value of those is usually it'll hit the 80% that most people are likely to screw up, <laughs> that if you can catch it, you can fix it, and you'll avoid problems, things like the, the no index. Um, however, technical SEO can be very, very, very technical, and it's folks like us that get paid to go do that stuff, right? Because it is, it's a niche kind of specialty. It's much harder to get tools that are as good at that, um, or even if they are relatively robust, they'll service the data in the way that can make it harder to action if you're not familiar with technically, like things like, you know, there's render blocking JavaScript that's doing this weird funky thing for this one type of crawler, right? You have to usually run some tests, but anyhow. Getting back to this, so there's some tools that you can use. Um, one of the best ones I find, because it's easy, is Google Search Console. Anybody not using Google Search Console here? Okay, so I'll spend a little time on it. So Google Search Console is a tool, it's a free tool that Google provides, which uh, surfaces some information about how Google sees your website. 
So they, from a technical perspective. So we'll look at it and say, these are, this is the amount of pages that we're indexing. These are the errors that we're seeing. Um, you know, they will send you alerts if you're no indexed for some reason. So it's a, it's a really kind of simple tool, but it's Google is kind of elevating this information to you because they're trying to get you to do best practices in order to have the site uh, function correctly in terms of search. Um, so it's a great one to use and it's kind of nice and, and easy. Um, if you want to dig in a little bit, um, there's a variety of tools out there. Uh, one of the ones that um, I and my team likes to use is Screaming Frog SEO Spider which is a wildly inventive name, but it's actually a really great tool. Except if you have really, really big sites that you're crawling, then use DeepCrawl, because uh, just this is a memory hog. Uh, but for a reasonable size site, it's a good tool. And it allows you to do lots of kind of custom crawling. Um, so you can set up things like uh, this custom search looks at whether or not you have uh, analytics on the site, uh, Google Tag Manager, and if you're using uh, structured data, what's, what's also called schema or microdata. So you can set up any kind of kind of custom crawl that you want, and you end up with these kind of pretty reports. Well, to me, they're pretty. I don't know how you guys feel about it, but <laughs> pretty reports that give you information about redirects and 404s and you know meta language and kind of all these things that are really important from a, a technical perspective, uh, but really put some other people like my wife to sleep when I talk about it. But. <clears throat> Anyhow, lots of great information um, in this tool. It's also like $99 a year, and there's a free version. So if your site's, I think if you have 500 URLs or less, those are the experts in the room. So if you have 500 URLs or less, it's free, and if you want more, then it's like $99 a year, so that's pretty cheap. Um, Google also has a tool, uh, tool like uh, PageSpeed Insights, um, and I want to kind of talk a little bit about this. So. Um, First, there's some good data that shows that um, page load speed is incredibly important for, at least from a technical perspective, for ranking. So again, this is data from Backlinko. In their audit, they found that um, an average page one SERP result loads in anywhere from two to two and a half seconds. Um, now, uh, my company are Google Premier Partners, so like we have the Bat Phone, Google HQ, like come and do training with us, out with us. So they were uh, at our offices uh, last year, and um, I pulled one of our guys aside and was like, I'm curious, how fast does a site really need to load from an ideal perspective in order to rank well? Any guesses on what the answer was? Half a second. I was like, yeah, nobody but Google's going to do that. That's not how that works. Now, in, in practice, it's not really that. Um, the, the moral of the story is make it load as quickly as you can, especially if your users are heavily mobile. Um, that's why there's things called like AMP mobile pages where the feeling is that they load uh, instantly. Google really loves that. Um, but looking for ways and using tools like uh, PageSpeed Insights um, or Pingdom or, or even Screaming Frog will tell you um, kind of average page load speed and then optimizing things like image file size, uh, video sizes, uh, minifying scripts, um, you know, getting rid of render blocking scripts, all those things help pages load more quickly. Why does Google like that? Because they believe it's gonna help you deliver a better user experience, and they're smart enough to know the better user experience they can get you to deliver, the more that users will use Google. Yes, sir. Uh, so in real time work in automation, Mm -hmm. We uh, anything that was longer than a tenth of a second, you could you could turn us away. Yeah, you should um, meet my twelve-year-old. She, <laughs> she won't pay any attention yeah, anymore, longer than a tenth of a second. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Google also has a tool uh, that's a mobile-friendly test that looks at will the site render correctly on uh, mobile um, devices. One thing that I have found fairly consistently, both in the page speed uh, tool and this tool, is that Google will always find something wrong that you should fix. And only about half the time does it actually need to be fixed. So kind of take these with a grain of salt, but again, they're good directional tools. Um, there's also other good tools out there, like Browser Stack is an example, where you can test sites across a whole bunch of different devices um, and different kind of sizes. Um, there's also some technical tools you can use that will look at <coughs> excuse me, uh, whether or not a site has duplicate content. 
So um, uh, Screaming Frog SEO Spider uh, does a little bit of this also. But um, there's a website called SiteLiner. I don't know if anybody's ever used it. What it'll actually do is it'll crawl your website and then look at the percentage of repeated copy. And it will tell you, like, you have, you know, 60% of your pages that have 20% of repeated content. Why is that useful? Because Google and other search engines hate duplicate content. They want as much original content, both on your site and across sites as possible. Um, and SiteLiner is actually free. Um, I think it's up to 400 or 500 uh, URLs. And after that, it's, you know, fifty hundred dollars a month, so it's not terribly expensive. <coughs> okay. Any other questions on this stuff before we move on? Try to keep us here as close an hour as I can. Okay, so um, I also want to talk about strategic link building, and I have a confession to make. I really hate link building. It's stupid. Like I just don't like spending my time on it personally. I will be the first to go hire somebody else to do it, um, especially approaching it from like a traditional SEO perspective. So my point of view on link building, and those of you that. Um, are in the more advanced camp, feel free to challenge me on this, is I think really great link building is just really great PR. Um, when you are doing really great PR, you have content that people want and are willing to share, and they will like you for it. I'm not a big believer in, kinda, you know, we've all gotten those emails like, hey, I have a blog post that I wrote. Do you want to exchange links? Like, I think that stuff is kind of low value. Even if it works, and in some cases it does, I think it's a little bit like a needle in a haystack. Um, but I do want to talk about three strategies um, that I've seen that have kind of worked that aren't just like pure uh, PR, um, that are a little bit more kind of towards the traditional SEO link building. Um, so first is something called broken link conquesting. Does anybody have any experience with this? Um, it's a little bit like finding a needle in the haystack, but the approach is fairly simple. Um, you use a tool, again, this is Ahrefs, um, again, one of my favorites. Um, and they have this nifty little broken link finder. So um, this example is from a company called WalkMe, because we work with their competitor, Pendo. And um, what you can do is you can say, show me every site in Ahrefs index that is linking to WalkMe, or whatever the site is you're looking at, that that link is broken. And then what you can do is you can call all those lists and email every single one of those webmasters and say, hey, we have another piece of content that's similar and we noticed that this link was broken. How about you link to us instead? Simple, works. You're gonna get one out of 50 responses depending on the quality of your content, but it is a way to build links. And also a good way to piss off your competitors, which I always think is fun. <coughs> Second, also one of my favorites, you can play to ego. Um, this works on me. So I, had, I was at a conference last year, and I did a talk about something. I think it may have been SEO. And I had somebody come up after me and said, hey, I have a podcast. You want to sit down and be on it? I was like, yeah, I want to be on it. This sounds great. It's like, okay, cool. I'm going to go post it, and then I'm going to go send it to you. So what did I do? I shared it with everybody I knew. I posted it on my company's website. I made all my employees share it. It's a fairly good interview if you want to go listen to it. Um, so it played to my ego and it works. Um, you will see this oftentimes happen in what are called roundups. So uh, this is an example of a roundup where they went out and said, you know, talk to 10 or 12 kind of thought leaders about SEO, got a quote from them, tagged all of them, and then asked all of them to share it because they were featured, right? Very simple approach to take. Works almost every time. There's also another strategy called uh, skyscrapering. Um, and this one's simple in concept, but a little bit harder to pull off. So it works like this. So first, you pick a keyword or a topic that you think is important or valuable to your audience. And then you plug that keyword into Google. And then you look at what the results are. And you read the first page of results. Because again, most of us know about 91, 92% of all clicks go to the first uh, page results. So if you're on page two or beyond, nobody's reading your content anyway. Um, and also Google will tell you what they think is good because it's on the, the front page. So you read all that and you start to kind of map out, one, what the topics are and how they're addressing the topics, the quality of the content and the kind of format. So usually when running this, one of two things happens. Either you have a decent amount of good content of a certain type Maybe it's really long format content, maybe it's video, or it's pretty clear that Google has no idea what their searchers are looking for. 
Like you just end up with this like mishmash of different topics. Um, if it's a mishmash of different topics and you know that your primary customer is looking for this in um, it, like that keyword, keyword or that topic in any kind of volume, it's a great opportunity to own the space. But really what you're trying to do is say, okay, what's really good about this content? And then how can I make something way, way better? Again, not 1x better, not 2x better, 10x, 12x, 20x better. And then you go make it better. Right? You have to actually have a content strategy that can live up to that. You then go and take the top results that you've audited, plug them back into a tool like Majestic, uh, SEO, or Ahrefs, look at who's linking back to them, and then you go pitch those sites to say, hey, we've just created this awesome piece of content. Would you read it? Do you want to share it? Do you want to link back to it? And you'll build links that way. So it's kind of like a more SEO specific PR strategy. Any questions on that? So you know you can end up things like this as an example. Go look at like omnichannel marketing, all the variations of content. You go, you audit the SERP. Um, you go read what the really great piece of content is, and then you go write something better. Right? Fairly easy in terms of approach. Quick question on that. Yes, sir. So is that because uh, that sounds like collaboration? You, I mean, you're you're trying to create a link to somebody else's content or give them your link to your content. Yeah. That's you're, you're trying to get them to link to your content so and share your content. Or how often does that work? Is that just like business B two B? It is. It will work as effectively as your content is. So it it's a little bit like PR, right? You know, just because you ask for a link or you ask a newspaper to write something about you doesn't mean they will. You have to give them a reason. Well, there's so, a lot of newspapers, tech newspapers that will just write about. You. Well, yeah, they may do it as what's called the nofollow link, so they'll link to it, but they won't actually give you the backlink credit. So yeah, that, that's why directories tend not to work very well anymore. You used to be able to just submit to a whole bunch of directories, and then they all started putting nofollow tags on them. So you can still get the link, but they're not very useful. Uh, can you explain nofollow tags for us to do? Sure. So um, there's a couple of different ways to link that somebody can provide a link. Um, one is that they just link to you, and that's what's called a follow link. Um, and that follow link will pass along authority, or what's sometimes referred to as link juice. Like it's, they have some, whatever their authority is, there's some credit that they're passing along, because it's essentially a vote of confidence in you. Um, however, if somebody wants to provide you a link, but does not want to give you credit for it, they can use a link tag that's no follow, which basically says, I'm going to link to you, but search engines don't, don't, believe that I trust them. So what, and the reason why that, that can be used is like in the case of directories, like a lot of people for a long time were using directories as a way to quickly build links and they're riding off the authority of those sites and they're like, no, 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 like we're not, we don't want to do that. Um, there are also times where publishers will do that, particularly if they are uh, repurposing or republishing um, content. So they'll use a nofollow link back to the original author, and then they'll use what's called a rel canonical link tag to say we're not the original publisher of this content. You know, Google will go look at this other site in order to do it. So it's a way of like, from a user level, getting the benefit of the content, but not trying to steal SEO authority. Okay, so uh, I've been talking for about an hour here. Surprise, more people haven't left the room, so thanks for hanging out. Um, so to sum things up quickly, and then I have one uh, request of you guys. Um, so first, um, when you're thinking about SEO in order to put the user first, first is you have to know them better than they know themselves. Right? You gotta have your personas, you gotta understand what's important to them, you gotta be talking to them every day, because the truth of the matter is, is that many users know what they want, and then even more users don't know what they want, but until you show it to them. So, Second is you always have to focus on educating or enabling action. Again, fundamentally, great user experience is about removing distractions and making it easier for the user to complete whatever action they want. Third is you have to create delightful, not frustrating, multi-device web experiences. So again, search engines don't only want a mobile view or desktop view, they just want one view that a user can consume wherever they are. 
Um, you need to be focused on customer, not company language, and understanding kind of the language overall they're using queries. You have to invest in remarkable content that helps first and sells second. Um, I would argue of everything that's on this list, that is the hardest thing to do, because that's called marketing, and most marketers are terrible at it. <coughs> um, and last and certainly not least, I would encourage you not to overly emphasize technical when it comes to SEO. Technical is important, but I don't think it's the most important. And usually when you're talking to SEOs, that's where they focus their time. I would encourage you instead to focus on the whole user, the whole SEO experience. Okay? So I know I said uh, that I would have one request for you, um, and uh, let me start by just thanking all of you for uh, you know, coming and uh, listening to me today. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, we are hiring. So uh, we have a couple dozen of us in our Durham office currently. We actually have four positions up, but one of them is for an office manager position. I didn't think anybody here wanted to be an office manager. Um, and we intend to open another three to six positions over the course of the next couple months, so feel free to check out um, our site. Um, we are hiring an account coordinator for our client services team, an advertising specialist for our advertising team, and a project manager for our project management team. Um, we actually do not have an SEO position open right now, but it's one of the new positions I'm flirting with, so I'm um, open to talking to those as well. Um, if you know anybody that is interested, tell them to go to our website or go to our uh, um, job website, which is methodsavvy.workable.com. You can read the job descriptions. And I'm off my soapbox, so thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, anybody additionally has. Yes, sir. So about five or six years ago, there was, uh, I won't call it a scam, a scheme, uh, where people were uh, offshoring, uh, contacting uh, places offshore that would just spin up a website and put a backlink. How did Google um, deal with that problem? Yeah, so I... What was uh, it called? Some, some yeah, so it, it's basically blog rings. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So a funny story, um, and then I'll directly answer your question. So maybe seven, eight years ago, we had a company out of Atlanta come to us um, and say they had this great new SEO technology. They wanted our help marketing. They said, okay, we're going to go do some auditing. So we went in and we audited, we tried to understand technology, and what they were doing was that. They were building networks of sites that would then point to your site for a certain period of time, however long you subscribe to it. So what search engines do, and Google in particular, is they started to map those networks. So they look at things like um, IP blocks and C names to see, like, so one of the problems that those scammers had is they were setting up all the sites on the same server like Russia, <laughs> and if it all comes from the same IP or same IP block, they're going to go, eh, you know, maybe it's not all these different sites, maybe it's just like one owner. Um, so they, they basically map the network, and they start to understand the interlinkings, and when they start to see commonalities, then they'll start to, to clash it in. I mean, uh, many of uh, things like Blue Host and all that shared services, mm -hmm. so that might create a um, yes, but the way that they do that is a little bit different. So it w in order to have a blog network that has value, it has to have a, there's no real thing as such as domain authority, even though if you look at tools like Moz or Ahrefs, they'll, they'll have a KPI that's domain authority. What they're really talking about is their measure of how trusted they think, search engines think that site is. So when I use domain authority, that's what I mean. But when you have blog networks, like if you're just propping it up, and you have a thousand sites suddenly pointing somewhere, they all have low trust, low domain authority. They don't care. You know, like they'll, they'll just ignore it. So you have to, as a scammer, you have to invest in like making these sites really trustworthy <laughs> in order to point them places. Um, so it, it can get a little tricky, but like if you're if you're just propping up sites for whatever reason and then trying to point them, they're, they're pretty much just ignored. Um, rarely will you be penalized. Um, however, the other way that uh, search engines will look at is also the quality of those sites. So if those sites look spammy, they'll end up being uh, what are some, some oftentimes referred to as toxic backlinks. So if you have you know, 10,000 backlinks and 9,900 of them are low quality, then they're gonna go, well, your site's probably low quality too. So the it's not just the number of links, it's also what the quality of those links are. Through uh, 
finally figured out that their site scan didn't just read them out. That would, that would be me. <laughs> you had to call them and tell them? No, no, they called us and went, what's wrong with their site? And that was the first thing I looked at. So they paid us money for about five minutes worth of work. It was great. <laughs> Um, so I, I have a question. Do you have a checklist that novices could run through, or even people who know SEO but like just need structure, uh, so that if we covered all those bases, you essentially have a, a really good SEO on site as well as so like Yoast does that, but it doesn't take care of the technical SEO. So I'm thinking more comprehensive. Um, so I don't have one with me. If you email me, I can send you one. Uh, but it won't be one that I wrote. It'll be one from either Moz or Search Engine Land because they actually have really good summaries. The ones that we write tend to be very specific to, like we actually just get, delivered one to a client we're working with yesterday about um, their site migration. So it's like a pre and post migration checklist. Um, but yeah, there are some very good lists out there that I'd be happy to share, share a link with you on. And I have a couple of follow-ups if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, one is, do you recommend WordPress for most sites uh, as a good way to keep your site SEO friendly? Um, so I'm a big fan of WordPress. I've actually worked with Frank on a couple WordPress sites. Um, there are some distinct advantages and some potential disadvantages, both from an SEO perspective and also overall. So uh, without getting into a long discussion about it, and Frank, feel free to jump in here too, because I know you, you and I have talked about this. Um, WordPress being uh, one of, if not the most popular CMS in the world, is widely supported. So it's actually relatively easy to find developers, like him, he's very good, mm -hmm. uh, if anybody needs help, um, who can support a WordPress site. I like that because I don't like lock-in. Like I hate, you know, we, all of us probably have this experience, you go work with a team, and they have their own CMS, and then you want to leave, but you can't because they're using the CMS, so it's mm -hmm. a huge pain in the ass to move. So I like the mobility of that. Um, also, there's a very broad uh, plugin community, so it's relatively easy to add features, including um, SEO-friendly features. Um, there's also some very good services out there that are tuned to speed um, and security for WordPress. Um, so hosts like uh, WP Engine is a, is a good example. Um, and as we just talked about, speed and security can, can be uh, very important for SEO. Um, where it can get a little tricky is if you're not properly focused on security, because it's open source, it's very easily hacked. So um, if you're investing in WordPress, and most of the sites that we, we design and, and develop are on WordPress, because again, it's widely supported for all the reasons I just said, we basically require our clients to go to a host that prior, prioritizes security. Because if you don't keep it updated, it is like in a matter of weeks, it's gonna be automatically hacked and then your SEO is gonna to go to hell because you're just gonna get the index because it's all malware. So the last question I have is, I went to your site um, and I noticed that your homepage doesn't have a lot of text on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't see any case studies, but I looked really quick. Mm -hmm. I saw a blog mm -hmm. uh, about lemonade stand and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So I was wondering how this translates into your own company strategy. Sure. So um, we intentionally don't invest in SEO. Okay. I know, surprising, right, considering I give these talks. Um, but um, it's because of the way that we target our customers. So um, there's, without getting overly complicated, there's kind of two ways to think about demand generation or lead capture. Um, there's hunting and fishing. So if you're fishing, you're taking like the HubSpot inbound marketing approach, which is usually where you get into SEO. So you're building a lot of high quality content and you want people to find you. Um, we're much more hunting oriented. So we have we hunt, we go after a very particular kind of client, which are B2B and e-commerce brands that are growth oriented and typically on a growth acceleration curve. Um, and in order to really get in front of them, we have to go find them. So the way that we do it is a lot of thought leadership work in terms of speaking engagements. Um, and then we also use some tools that allow us to build uh, what are called account-based marketing lists, and then we'll communicate to them in tracks. So the site is intentionally thin because what we're selling is problem identification and solution definition, and then enablement of those solutions. So we don't want people coming to us saying, I want SEO, or I want a website. I want people to come to us and say, 
I think I might have a problem help me figure out what it is. So our, our demand gen strategy is a little different. SEO is less important to us. So I'm just running around with the mic. Who else has a question? I'm on my way. Uh, one of the things I have noticed a lot with sites that I keep, clients keep asking me to look at is, uh, and I keep telling them, yeah, the content needs to be completely rewritten because it wasn't written for a human. When that's hell, hard. When the hell did that start? You know, it's like, I look at sites that are a certain vintage of, you know, say two, three, four years ago, and all of a sudden I start, you see this recite, recirculating content, you see these pages that, that don't want to link or lead anywhere. It's like, I, I look at that and I go, that, is, that doesn't even make sense for, it's like, even as an SEO beginner, that doesn't even make sense. Yeah, so there, there was a crop of <coughs> inbound marketing, content marketing, kind of SEO um, thought leaders that, I don't know, probably seven, eight years ago, where the recommendation was to have, you know, focus a page on a certain keyword, have a certain amount of keyword density in it, and you were basically writing it where it was human readable, but you knew you were also trying to address the algorithm, and that approach got very popular, and then Google rolled out some algorithm changes like Penguin and Panda and RankBrain, which basically was designed to um, de-emphasize the value of that approach, because Google, and this is probably five or six years ago, had a real quality problem in their SERP. Like users were starting to get really frustrated that they were finding pages that were ranking highly that just didn't provide a lot of value. So Google did a lot of work to change their algorithm to penalize those kinds of sites. So um, my perspective is that you see a bunch of sites with that kind of content because there was, for a couple of years, that actually worked. And then it stopped working. <laughs> and then the sites just didn't evolve. And also, writing really good content is hard. So. Like any of us that do this kind of consulting work, you, know, you talk to a client, you tell them what they need, and they're like, yeah, no, but there's gotta be a trick, right? No, no, there's no trick. You just have to do good user experience, be a good marketer, and have something valuable to say. <coughs> I wanna add one layer on that, which is uh, the pervasiveness of misinformation, like the blog networks. Oh, I yeah. still see a lot of people talking about blog networks being a good thing. Uh, that's why we have the Raleigh SEO Meetup to talk with real SEOs that are doing the work mm -hmm. and uh, find out that those things are wrong. Oh yeah, <laughs> same. <laughs> Who else has got a question? I'm working with a client right now that has, they've been generating content for probably 15 years on their website with a lot of old blog posts, all of which are generally related to what they're doing, but mm -hmm. content varies significantly. Yep. Um, and they were all re-imported from a website redesign. Is there a lot of value to keeping those up? So the terrible answer is maybe. <laughs> cool. So the, the way to look at that is both from a business perspective and from an SEO perspective. And, and, and I'm making that distinction because sometimes what's good for SEO is not good for business and vice versa. So like whenever, particularly when we're doing like enterprise level SEO programs, will say, well, this is the right thing to do for SEO, but let's stop and think about what this means for the business. So like in, in this particular case, when you go and you audit all the content, and you organize it by theme, by topic, by action, by stage of the buyer you know, decision-making process, like all the various ways you can organize content, you, know, you may say, hey, this addresses problems that are no longer interesting or important to our user. In that particular case, it may actually make sense to remove that content, use 301 redirects to point it to content that is similar in topic but more useful. There are other times where the content is fine, maybe it's not 10x great, but it, it's okay, um, or it actually has some value. Um, and you can use tools, again, like Majestic or Ahrefs to see that those pages are generally um, generally have a high authority, in which case you do want to keep them, because they actually may be capturing traffic. And in those cases, it, you know, thinking through, well, do I want to redesign the page or have a banner that actually pulls somebody from this page deeper into the site from a user experience standpoint can be the right way to go. 
Um, so again, it, it really depends on kind of what the intent is from the business side. Uh, but generally speaking, if it is good content and they have links back to it, at the very least, set up three or one redirects in order to take the, the authority. Any more questions? All right. Let's uh, thank Jake one more time. Thank you. Very much. And uh, as mentioned before, uh, we're all going to head out of here. And uh, those that want to take off, you're welcome to. Uh, if you want to uh, chat over a beer, we're going to head over to Rookies, which is just down the street from here. And uh, that's a good place to ask some of those questions that maybe you don't want to have a whole audience, but just a one-on-one -on -one chat about. Thank you for coming out. <laughs>